Let's begin at the beginning. Where did you grow up? And tell us a bit about your family. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and my father said that the uh, taxes were too high. <laughs> so we uh, fled it to um, Columbus, Ohio to get away from some taxes. So I spent the rest of my youth in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I'm currently living on a farm in Southern Ohio. Where in Southern Ohio? Uh, Frankfurt, which is near Chillicothe. It's very small. <laughs> So tell us a bit what prompted you to explore SM sexuality. I, I saw this program on television when I was three years old. And uh, it was Boys Town. And these guys were walking around in a duck waddle. And I said, that's hot. Because <laughs> uh, they made them walk, you know, walk around in a duck waddle. Huh? That was really hot. And... Um, uh, later on, somebody got put in a cell, and I thought that was really cool. And, uh, it, you know, so I started doing, uh, you know, having SM fantasies at sort of around that age, and I knew there was no role models for this. <laughs> so I really didn't tell anybody. <laughs> well, tell, tell us a little bit about those those fantasy scenes that you had as a child. I, you know, when I was real little, I thought about stuff like machines. I didn't know anything about sex. But I did know a lot of my imagination about SM. So a lot of my fantasies at that time were machines doing things uh, instead of people doing things. For example? Um, you know, like I think Rule Goldberg spanking contraptions. Um, <laughs> and interesting stuff like that. Sort of like, you know, the mousetrap game. You know, where the ball moved from here to here to here to here. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, so machines were doing things rather than people, which was which shows you where a three-year-old is at, which is not... Well, I didn't know about role models <laughs> yet. Didn't know anybody else was like this except for me. So tell us a little bit about networking with others during your journey. How did that benefit you in your SM journey? Um, and when I was in eighth grade, I saw a magazine, and the magazine was called I, and it sort of implied that there were uh, a dirty old men in Times Square that, you know, had, that there was SM in Times Square for dirty old men. So I, then I thought, oh, well, maybe there's no other women besides me like this, but there are dirty old men if I could ever get to Times Square. <laughs> um, so uh, and so I, at one point I got divorced and, and decided that, uh, you know, I just... Fucking my husband up the ass with a dildo with a strap on was not really all there was to SM. And then I really ought to find a community out there. Um, so uh, that's when I decided that I was going to find a community. I went to the library. I got a book on SM by Weinberg. And there was an essay in there by Pat Califia, now Patrick. And I wrote Patrick and I said, so there are women into this, yeah? And Patrick says, yeah, but... You know, you gotta go to either Boston or San Francisco to get to a support group. So that's what I did. I drove for a one-hour support group meeting, 17 hours from Columbus, Ohio, to Boston, to Urania. And those women were so neat to me. And I came home and I decided I was going to start a group in Columbus, Ohio. And I told absolutely everyone I knew that I was SM and that I was starting this group. And people's jaws dropped. <laughs> and I got told that um, it would be better to have a book at the local feminist bookstore saying that Hitler was right <laughs> than have Sam Waugh's book, uh, you know, coming to power. And uh, I kind of knew that I was fine because I'd been like this since three years old, so I had a fairly good self-concept. So I knew that there was nothing wrong with me, but that was daunting. And if I hadn't had that self-concept, I might have, like, scurried back in the closet. But instead, <laughs> I, I'm naive as I was, I decided to form the Swimming Group Club where I rose, and that was in 1984. And believe me, we did not know what we were doing. i had done solo for lots of years, so I had more experience than anybody else in the club. But, uh, you know, this was the first time I'd ever tried it out on other people, which was what I really wanted to do. Um, I did get women to fall for this. 
uh, people started telling other people, there's this girl who's in the SM and you really ought to meet her, you know? So we had this club called Briar Rose, and uh, it was really great. Uh, I had this, uh, oh, we would do things like I had this Victorian couch, and I had, had a woman back on her back, and I would sit on this Victorian couch, and we would do the you fisting. And you know why? It was because I was reading Larry Townsend. Yeah. You know, I was reading a London's handbook. That's what there was out for me. And I thought, this is how they do SM. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to do all of it. Um, and uh, so it became very important to have those women to start making those contacts. And then we got this little letter in the mail. A little letter that said, there's going to be a march on Washington in 87 would you like to come to the SM convention? And it was signed, Barry Douglas. And I thought, who is this Barry Douglas and why is he throwing this party for us? So I thought, I'm gonna call him up and I'm gonna say, yeah, and so where's, where's the hotel? Where do we start partying? I didn't know the community wasn't quite there yet. But I, I called Barry Douglas and the first, because I'm pretty good at getting phone numbers. And he says, how did you get my number? <laughs> Well, of course, by the 93 March on Washington, I was working with Barry as the co-person doing logistics. Um, and so we started in 88 to form a National Weather Association. So for those who aren't particularly familiar, tell us about the National Weather Organization. What was it in its original incarnation? Originally, it was meant to be an organization of organizations. So in other words, every single leather club in the entire United States wanted to be a member and sent members. And when they formed the Dal when they went to Dallas, to the bloodbath that was Dallas, <laughs> people came and you know, you, you probably were there. I, I know Jim Richards was there and he was just shaking his head. Tony Boaz was sitting there shaking his head. And, well, what um, went on in Dallas? So what? Uh, yeah, you know, the people, uh, they, a lot of the gay guys wanted to be an organization of organizations. A lot of the gay women were angry and upset because they were afraid that the men were going to co-opt power, and there were all these bad feelings floating around about, you know, men and women, East Coast, West Coast. Well, after the whole weekend was over, there were only a few unscathed people left <laughs> to form the committee, you know, to run this. To start this organization, and you know, I happen to be one of I happen to be one of them. Um, so at the time, it was going to be an organization of organizations. But the, for people who were in places where there were no organizations, we kind of thought, well, we also need to have individuals involved. And there were people who didn't want individuals involved; they wanted only organizations. And eventually, NLA drove into uh, being more of an individual organization with chapters, rather than being an organization of organizations. And there still isn't an organization of organizations. But to some extent, the internet has filled that contact void that was, that was not, you know, that, that there was that void prior to the internet of how organizations got melded together to actually do anything. And at the time, we felt terribly pressured to coalesce into some kind of a unified factor because we felt that we were politically um, at risk, that people might actually, and people were actually, getting arrested, Thunderhead in Boston, uh, Spanner in England, uh, that people were getting arrested, and we really felt like we needed to do something before that, that ended up becoming widespread and that we'd all end up in jail. Well, you were the National Weather Association's first chairperson for domestic violence. Please tell us about that role. Um, I, we had problems over the years with uh, submissives wondering, is what my top doing to me really SM? And, you know, sometimes if we had newbies that didn't know, you know, they got into trouble. And we personally got tired of 
driving to another city, extricating somebody, and driving into another city and getting them set up. And we started thinking, Pat uh, Cliff here wrote an essay about uh, ethics and uh, what was going on with domestic violence in the SM community. And NLA said, we really have to be upfront about this because of who we are. This is really important for our members and to, for the general public to understand who we are and who we are not. So uh, we got together and I wrote a statement on domestic violence and the entire national group, which at that time was very large because a lot of organizations were still in it, I hammered this thing out over hours and hours. We came up with a statement of domestic violence, which has now been used in court proceedings. Uh, it's now been translated into many languages. Um, it's been you know, published in a book by Simon and Schuster. Um, it got very wide coverage, to say the least. And uh, I think that it's meant the difference to a lot of people. And our club still is very strong, has a very strong uh, organization to try to get out the word about what the difference is between SM and domestic violence. In your opinion, what is that difference? Well, consent is a big, <laughs> big thing. Um, and uh, we also believe that, uh, say, you know, you're, you're afraid on a Wednesday night, and then later on Saturday when nothing violent is happening, you're asked to give consent. It still is not really consent on Saturday because of what happened on Wednesday. So uh, consent is not just what happens that day, but it's an overall relationship, what's happened before. Can you give consent if you're afraid? Not really. What positions have you held in the NLA? You've had several. Uh, I, I, I think all told, except for about a six month period, I was on the board for probably 13, 14 years. And that included uh, being treasurer at a time when uh, we had a treasurer abscond with $17,000. And this is something we do want other clubs to know. This can happen to you. It happened to us. Um, and it's really shocking when it happens. Uh, so I was treasurer for about four years to solve that debacle. And uh, uh, then I was on the board, just in general on the board. And then I was also uh, co-chair, president, what, what, what do they call us, Mark? Head honchos, uh, chief. Wisdom keepers, co-chairs. <laughs> chief cook and bottle washer. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, muckety muck. Hi, muckety muck. Our original setup was that we had a female co-chair and a male co-chair, but so many people transitioned <laughs> to the other gender in other terms that we just had to not be able to get any more. <laughs> <laughs> you got Doug. <laughs> uh, oh, I need a second after that one. When we spoke earlier, you mentioned that there was actually a time in your life when you were so busy with things going on that you didn't even have time to get laid. So, uh, yeah, tell yeah. us about that. I, I mean, I, you know, if you're in one of these organizations and you're running all this stuff and you're going to all these meetings, you really, if you want to have sex, you've got to schedule it, and that's between the co chairs meeting and the, you know, the, the, the local chapter meeting, and your girlfriend is saying, okay, look, we can stop at this rest stop. How many times did you do that? I, you know, the, 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 you know, the portable vibrator that plugs in your car became very poor. <laughs> about the NLA's death panel workshop. That was fascinating for me to hear. <laughs> uh, we had a panel with, I don't know, I think it was on Tony DeBlas and uh, a guy that was an ex-Jehovah's Witness, uh, and I'm not going to name his name because um, I, I'm not sure if he was anyway, people would know that he was on that panel, but <laughs> you know how Jehovah's, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses are? Those folks get told by their parents that you know, they're going to dig a grave and for you, and you're going to be pushed in, and no, no need to go to college. And so no wonder he sort of was on that panel. And um, they started talking about edge play, 
And uh, in this edge play, people were talking about doing scenes that could involve death and that they were willing to take that risk. And um, I think that NLA was always very open to still discussing and putting out in the open topics like breath play and self-hanging, um, autoerotic play, asphyxiation play. And I think we always felt that it was very important to talk about that because if you don't talk about it, people who are doing it, believe me, people who are doing it, are going to go underground. And then they're not going to meet other people who can talk to them about fail safes. Now, of course, there are no fail safes, but to be a little bit safer. Um, and I know that from the years after that workshop, people called it the death panel. But in truth, we were talking about something really important, which is why are you playing? And I kind of determined for myself that a good scene was a scene that you could repeat, and therefore you had to be there in order to repeat it. Um, and, but on the other hand, I know that there are people who play on the edge. And what we need to say, and believe me, I love people that I know that play on the edge. I love them very much. And we say, look, you have a kid, you get term insurance for three times your salary. Then you want to go do this? It, it, be my guest. Get a second to be with you when you do it. Wow. Okay. That's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> How did the NLA benefit the Spatter case in the United Kingdom? Uh, well, in 1993, March on Washington, Barry Douglas came over to me, and you always wonder when Barry's coming over to you and says he needs to talk to you what it is. <laughs> and Barry came. Uh, this is a man who believed that the ends justified the means. <laughs> as long as it was for other people's rights, it was okay to do, even if he maybe got trampled in the process. But he came over to me and he says, I only have to talk to you about something, and I have somebody to introduce you to. And I said, okay. And out came this man, Kellen Farshe, who had a magenta mohawk up to here, more piercings than I had ever seen in my whole life, all over his body. And, um, you know, I, I looked at Kellen, and I said, let's go talk over here. Tell me what's up, Kellen. And he starts telling me about Spanner, where a private party was busted up. Both the bottoms and the tops were arrested by the police in England. And um, there was nothing that even required medical attention. And these guys were put in prison. They got put in prison. For being a, even if they consented, they were put in prison. And this is what I really worried about, that we were headed for another Stonewall that I was going to have to stand at the barricades and throw rocks. And I was willing to do that. If, if one of my friends got put in prison, I was willing to go, you know, bring the cake with the, with the saw. And um, I said, Kellen, what do you need? And he says, I gotta we got to take this to the European Court of Appeals to see if they can overthrow this. I said, how much money do you need? He says, we need 140000 And I said, Kellen, United States, we will, we will try to get you half of that. And this guy, this gay man with all these piercings and this mohawk, leans over and kisses me very lightly on the forehead and says, thank you. And I started telling everybody I knew, everybody, I made pamphlets, I sent letters, I called people up. And clubs got very interested. New York was very strong in their interest. A lot of clubs uh, sent money. A lot of clubs did fundraisers. And we did not raise half, but we raised $55,000 when Michael Horowitz ended up, you know, <laughs> and in the middle of it, we got Amnesty International involved. I went to Amnesty and I said, here's what the problem is. Yeah, breadboarding. We had to explain breadboarding to Amnesty International. I said, yes, their dick is out on a board and they're hammering it in. But believe me, there's no medical attention required, and this was hard to do. <laughs> so we talked to Amnesty International, and their British 
part of Amnesty International did talk to, to the government there and say, we are watching you and what you do with this. Wow. Uh, so for two or three years, we, we went to Amnesty. We went to all the Amnesty meetings. Then we decided in Chicago at Living and Leather to march and picket the British Embassy. And that's what we did. Chuck Higgins wow. got pickets, went out to the British Embassy, and they knew we were there. <laughs> Incredible. We did, uh, we eventually, some of the guys got out, and uh, then more got out, and finally it all of them were out. But it's a shame that any of them spent a day in prison. Absolutely. And we don't want that to happen again, ever, anyway. <laughs> What would be your ultimate SMC? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'm very Victorian, but um, I do like sexual service, and I get very hot playing with my partner. Um, I, I really, really enjoy, um, I enjoy anything that gives a thud or a whack. Uh, it's got to make a lot of sound. That's just, I, I don't know what's going to happen when I go deaf, but uh, I really like the sound involved. And uh, after I make a lot of noise with somebody, uh, I really like being in a sling and really having somebody who knows how to use a strap on. And I've got my sling arranged on the chain by. Uh, you know, tape, colored tape, as to how you hang it onto which links, for which positions, for which sex act, for my pleasure. So, oh, the organization. <laughs> that works. <laughs> What's been your greatest SMC failure? You no, know, I had a, I had a person actually faint on me. Fortunately, she was kneeling, so it wasn't too far to the ground. <laughs> But, uh, I, you know, I, I, then I really understood that when people get sexually excited, their temperature goes up, and if it's hot in the room already, it's a bad combination. And from then on, I bought lots of panic snaps. <laughs> what does mentoring mean to you? Yeah, mentoring means if you don't want to get burnt out, you better find somebody to replace you. And in the early days, what happened was you earned your leather. So part of mentoring was you took somebody under your wing and you showed them the ropes. And I always loved, you know, newbies to the group because they did, did, didn't have any preconceived notions about what SM was supposed to be so that I could do whatever I wanted with them. <laughs> um, but uh, mentoring meant you took somebody under the, your wing you brought them into the language as well as what the activity was. They earned leather from you. Uh, you kept them out of the clutches of bad girlfriends or bad boyfriends or whatever. Um, and you saw them along with this process. And, and it wasn't just that they had to be your lover, because when I first came into the scene, there were no uh, women or uh, straight organizations in my area, so it was really important for me to be connected with gay men because uh, they were there to support you when you had questions like, what is the mine shaft in New York all about? Are there really big bathtubs lining the hallways that people get pissed off all the time? We gotta go, we gotta go. And so if they were the ones telling you, yeah, that's what the mine shaft is all about, stories. What advice do you have for community novices? <laughs> um, I think that the best thing to do that if you're a novice is get in with a club and get in a group. And NLA would be such a club, but there are other clubs like that, and if there's no club in your area, NLA we can always help you start a club. Because when you're in a club and you're meeting other people, then you're able to see whether or not that person has any friends, and whether or not they have a sense of humor. And then you can play in a group and you're not in a hotel and get you know left with nothing, even your wallet gone. Clubs, very important. I read that you have a collection at the Leather Archive 
and museums <coughs> with its history project. Please tell us a bit about that. Oh, I have so much stuff. <laughs> And every year, boxes and boxes go to the archives, where I'm sure they're probably still sitting. But when I get retired, I intend on going and living in my brother's house in Chicago for some time and go through all this material. But there are so many neat leather women uh, of the past, including uh, Jan Lyon and Sashi Hyatt, um, and people that I would really like us not to forget. So. You quoted Tony de Blas when we spoke, and he said something about leather community history. What did he say to you? He told me that when you submit stuff to the archives, put in the good, bad, and the ugly. Because that's how it happened. <laughs> uh, and as you know, there are seven sins of sadomasochism. And one of them is dirty community politics. <laughs> um, and it's all there. We didn't censor it. So tell us a bit about your professional work. I put books together. I edit people's story grammar all day. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst thing you've ever read? I, the absolute worst, worst thing that I ever read was a book that I did on a lady that channeled people from 250,000 years ago and it wasn't until the end of the book that I realized that she was talking to these ghosts and not to a real person. <laughs> they didn't explain that to the end of the book and I didn't think that was very fair so I said you gotta move that up to the preface that these are ghosts not real people you're talking to throughout the whole book. You wrote a guide and you created this guide, and it caters to SM people with businesses. Please tell us a bit about that. I'm working on a guide that would be um, for anyone who wanted to patronize a business that wasn't particularly a leather business. Uh, for instance, I put together books, and if you had a book together to, that you wanted to put together, um, I could do that for you, and you wouldn't have to worry about what the material was like because I understand how to, how to edit it. But I know that there are other people that are professional that are particularly in leather businesses. They might be in real estate. They might be in medicine. And well, I would really like our business to stay within our community whenever possible. And there wasn't really a guide out there. Trevor Jacques has a good one, uh, Alternate Sources, for different kinds of leather businesses. But I, I, I'm working on this one that's really not for leather businesses. So tell us a little bit about your work as an AIDS activist. Um, when I first got into the gay community, I wanted to find SM women. And some of along the way, I found gay men uh, who, I treated, who treated me and my daughter like we were queens, uh, which we never had that experience before. I actually thought there was biologically something missing in men about empathy. And then I met gay men, and I realized that gay men have what all men really have, which is empathy. But I didn't realize that that was possible. And they said, oh, it's possible, Jean. It's just how you're socialized. And we're, we're socialized differently. We, we know how to, how to delve into our, our feelings. And well, I got to be such good friends with them, and I lost 75% of my friends during the 80s. And um, I was really determined that I was going to get involved in the fight. So in um, the early 80s, in about 84, 85, uh, I joined the Columbus AIDS Task Force and did a lot of public speaking, but especially got into women's issues. We spoke to house, suburban housewives at, at nice medical centers out in the suburbs, but we also did a Clean Your Works program where we based an entire uh, AIDS awareness program off of a, a group in Tucson where we taught all the prostitutes of a particular area called Short North out of Columbus. And there were at least 250 women working in this area, if you can believe it. It was a small area. We based all our um, work with them off of a Tucson program where we gave them, we gave the women the education. And it, the Johns knew that these were the women that were educated. 
and somebody started patronizing the women that we were educating. This was really good. Uh, we also did a, a clean works program, safe sex, at um, the uh, prison. So I would go two floors underground, and I had a partner working with me, and we would teach the women, mostly who were there because of prostitution and drug use, uh, and specifically how to clean needles. But uh, that was a little on the scary side. But the women at the prison who took us down there, who were the switch shiny shoes and the uniforms, they were really hot. So. <laughs> <laughs> Made it worth your while, at least. Yeah. You know. yeah. What do you feel is the biggest misconception about you? I, you know, I, if people who really, really say that I look at like Cookie Andrews Hunt. And Cookie. Oh, and I, if you'll see her, she's on an A&E special about the Hillside Strangler up there because one of our NLA people got killed by the Hillside Strangler in, in Seattle. Uh, she's on there arguing for uh, better protection of sex workers. But I, Cookie was this, this lady who kind of lay in the weeds. And she was so normal looking. They kind of, you know, older and, and, and kind of flew on the frumpy side. And she would go to these Christian right meetings, like she was like one of them, and do the spy work about what they were up to, you know. Fascinating. And then come back and say, oh, they're planning a, a you know, a rally here, really good. And I think that the people who know me know that I'm kind of cookie and that I lay in the weeds. A little bit, but a lot of other people don't know that. They don't really know who I am. Um, yeah, but it's, at some point, uh, when you get asked directly, are you a sadomasochist? I don't care who you're talking to, you do say yes. There we go. Janet would like to thank you. That concludes the formal portion of the interview today.